Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Um, so as Austin said, I'm going to be talking about how teachers implement contract rating and how that affects feedback system writing. Um, this is based on some qualitative research I did with NYC instructors, um, surveying and interviews, going to go over some of the background and research, and then jump into my study and findings. So I think many of us are probably familiar with this, but just to get clear, um, contract rating is a way of assigning course grade, really just based on the tasks to students complete in your class, not about a perceived judgment of quality of that writing. Um, there's different construals of this, but broadly, um, it's about rewarding past completion labor, not um, whether your writing is A level quality, um, or about averaging out grades and kind of managing points and all that. And one of the big tenets of contract rating is um, if you're using the scheme, then you don't have to give a score or a grade on every assignment, right? Um, and people argue that this brings all kinds of benefits to both students and teachers in classes that use contract rating. Um, the published literature on contract rating kind of goes over two main strands or kind of ways of thinking about contract rating. One is what Peter Elbow and Jay Daniels call hybrid contract rating, where just by completing work, you can earn up to a B, earn an A or above, or some what's higher than a B. You need to produce writing that is of a certain quality, and the students that initiate that process, they would say, I want an A. You actually, a teacher, have to be the judge of my writing. And then the teacher kind of puts on their judge hat and says, Oh, good, this is A quality writing, you get an A. But students who don't want to do that can just complete everything, turn it in on time, get a B. Um, labor based contract rating is so in a way's formulation of it, building on um, Peter Elbow's writing. But I should note here that the contract rating tradition goes back into at least the 1960s and actually kind of originated in high school science classes, believe it or not, um, but has been taken up mostly these days by um, people in position studies. Um, Labor-based contract rating is just all about grading based on task completion. We'll look at an, an example of that in a second, um, where the teacher never takes on this role of judge of quality of writing. They'll respond to writing, but they're not. Um, at no point in the writing class will you as a teacher be saying, this writing is good or bad. You can't point out, hey, you didn't meet certain requirements for this assignment, but it's never going to be a judge of quality. Um, this is what one of the participants in my study called In a Way's Box, which I think is a, a funny and apt way of thinking about this. Um, and this is just a way of breaking down what grades students would earn in a writing class under this contract scheme. So if you uh, missed four days of classes, turned in four assignments later and complete, but didn't miss any assignments, you ended up turning everything in, then you get a B in this class. Um, if you only miss three days of class, only have two later and complete assignments and don't miss anything, you get an A plus and so on and so forth. Um, and that's it right now. Students, there's more to this playing instead of just presenting them with this box, but like when you're putting your grades in at the end of the year, like this is all you have to do, right? If you have kept track of this as a teacher, you can say, this is what I told students they would earn in the beginning, here's what it is. Um, this is also something you could negotiate with students, right? And there's other sort of features of the contract, what counts as late, for example, how you want to manage late assignments might be something that you could negotiate with your students. Um, in a way, as labor-based formulation of this grading scheme usually includes some degree of uh, negotiation with students, whereas the Elbow and Daniel Woods contract is people regard it as kind of unilateral, right? The teacher is just making it up and presenting it to students, and there's not really room for students to negotiate. Um, taking a step back from contract grading, um, we know some things about how grading and response to student writing are connected in general. Students receive feedback on a piece of writing in light of the assigned grade that that's been given to them, right? I think this is fairly intuitive. If a student gets a grade they're happy with, and there's lots of feedback and commentary, they might say, well, I'm happy with this grade. I don't need to really engage with this feedback, right? I don't really need to read that much. If a student receives a grade they're unhappy with, then they might see that feedback as something I need to fix to please the teacher or something I need to argue about in order to get a different grade. Um, this is like particularly important in the context of, as we've discussed already, that a student mental health, um, there's a lot of evidence that suggests that grades and anxiety are very closely tied for many college students, and that that kind of finding begins before they even matriculate in college. Um, again, I think it's very intuitive there. Um, and something we know from the literature 
literature and psychology about taking and receiving feedback is you have to be able to be emotionally regulated to use and receive feedback well. Well, if it's cause anxiety, it's going to be pretty hard for you to do that. Um, from the teacher point of view, teachers can feel pressure to justify the grade when given feedback, right? They might give more feedback than other students can actually use because they feel like they need to really give reasons for why the student got a B minus instead of a B plus. Um, or if teachers are using rubrics, right? Whether those are ones they develop themselves or ones the program asks them to use, um, that rubric might have a section on mechanics and grammar, and if that is a section of the rubric, you might feel like I have to give some feedback on this. Even if that's not what I really care about or what I think the students are going to learn from most. Um, and finally, institutional pressures affect how teachers get grade, which then affects how teachers get feedback. Um, the institution I was at most recently is at state. Um, there, the institution pays attention to the DM withdrawal rate of our first year writing classes, right? They're seen as gatekeeper classes. Um, there are initiatives to try to reduce the DFW rate, and that trickles down through the writing program to teachers and influences these decisions. Um, all of which is to say that um, grades and grading schemes and grading policies are one of many things that can structure and influence how teachers respond to student writing. Um, the literature on contract grading makes some specific points about what contract grading can do in kind of the space of response to student writing. Um, Peter Elbow and Jane Daniels put this most plainly when they say contracts make the value of the feedback more effective for learning. Um, the claim is very simple, but if students are not getting a grade at the top of an assignment, they will look at feedback more, read it more closely, use it, learn from it, right? Which is what all want as writing teachers. Um, but then we kind of develops this further and develops this into an anti-racist practice where um, not only by just having students use feedback better, um, the classroom can become a place where the teacher and students can practice resisting making judgments of language based on white language supremacy if you're not giving grades and scores on individual assignments, right? That kind of creates the conditions for um, resisting the whiteness that is sort of uh, built into academic spaces. Um, and more recently, teachers in a study by Elizabeth Tinoco and other authors report that um, when teachers adopt contract grading, they change how they give feedback, right? They feel a little bit more free, they feel like they can experiment. Um, and that's something that my study definitely supports that I found as well in the interviews I did with teachers. Um, but all this is really to say that um, the theoretical literature and the sort of little bits of um, empirical literature that we have about contract grading really says there's a connection here, says that something will change with feedback if you use contract writing about student learning, about the teacher experience. Um, and my study is trying to fill that gap, right? So say the people who write about contract writing have made these claims about how it can affect feedback in the classroom. Let's see what's really going on. Um, that then also raises the question of how teachers are actually using contract writing. Um, another kind of reason for the timing of this study is that contract writing, as I think most of us seem to know, um, has gotten a lot more prominent in recent years, um, kind of pre-COVID, the mid-2010s, um, this idea like, yeah, that contract grading could be kind of a cornerstone anti-racist uh, practice in writing classroom, gained a lot of prominence, largely but not exclusively through the work of Sao Um, And then COVID and calls for racial justice after George Floyd's murder led to even more attention to this, right? Um, I think both um, as writing programs were faced with this question of what do we do in terms of assessment and grades during COVID and how can we make our classroom more equitable? Um, some people, I think most notably Sherry Craig, have argued that this is kind of bait for writing programs, but actually this, this big focus on contract grading is actually um, in some ways an easy way out, right? If, if you kind of leave it as we're doing contract grading now and then don't uh, pursue other anti-racist practices or kind of turn your attention to the bigger anti-racist effect in the college and your classrooms, then you're not quite doing enough. Um, and so I think, um, again, another reason to really pay attention to this and pay attention to how teachers are using this is to kind of meet that argument, right? Like, um, we're, again, often white teachers kind of using this, plumbing out of this new idea of contract grading as a way to kind of not deal with bigger issues, shall we say. Um, so this all leads to this question, what are teachers doing now that contract grading has become more prominent? Um, as I said, it's existed for a long time, but it's been recently legitimized, right? It's been recently kind of gained some institutional status. And so how are teachers 
responding to that um, and using new ideas. Um, so I distributed the survey through my personal networks um, at SF State and other um, teaching institutions, all teaching post-secondary composition um, that asked for some basic demographic information and then also asked people if you wanted to be interviewed and then to pass along this survey to anyone that they thought would be interested. Um, for those participants that said they were willing, I did semi-structured interviews and um, the transcripts and coded um, those transcripts, mostly for looking for values, attitudes, and beliefs revealed in these interviews, um, trying to draw out what teachers thought was important um, about contract rating and feedback and how that structured their decision-making process, which is what I'm really interested in. Um, this is a little bit out of date. I've had a few more survey results since um, I put these slides together, but the 13 respondents that had responded when I made these slides, um, nine of them, nine of 13 have done graduate coursework on responding to student writing, and all of them have done some professional development for responding to student writing, and 10 out of the 13 said they had experimented with how they changed their grades in the past five years since the study was done in the spring, so the past five years includes a little bit before COVID and really through COVID. Um, this is just to say that the sample involved in the study of people who a lot about how to respond to student writing and are willing to think about doing grading in a different way, right? In other words, they're kind of um, right for the kind of experimentation that I want to look at here. Um, some three major themes emerged when I looked at my interview data. Um, the first one is that I what I call blended contracts. Um, when teachers implement contract grading, they tend to do it in pretty idiosyncratic ways. Um, I should have said this earlier, there's some copies at my desk, um, kind of a little bit categorically Dan, if anyone wants to get a copy of the slides to look at them, there they go. Um, there's big and small versions. Um, a lot of the contract grading literature kind of presents this very like start like box, right? Or, or this kind of a long kind of description of a contract you can use with your students. and, and to my knowledge, no, no teacher in my study certainly just adopted one of those wholesale, right? They always blended them with their pre existing practices, kind of tweaked it, made it their own. Um, and I want to read a quote from one participant that really gets to that. I'm currently calling my grading system hybrid. So it still retains numerical values for major assignments, you know, at a 100 point scale for grades. And there are components that are more contract based. It's like some elaborate system of levers and pulleys to try to get, you know, equitable grading system. So first of all, I just love that image of letters and pulleys, right? That is like something about uh, an image that captures what a lot of teachers told me was it feels like I'm trying to pull all of these different switches and tweak these things and also like get the engagement I need from students and like trying to get to some place that feels kind of equitable, right? Um, and that is like a constant, constant decision making process that I think is really interesting and, and um, something that we need to understand if we're going to really develop a theory of assessment um, in a paper that I've, I've kind of been working on based on literature I write, um, that any theory of assessment is kind of incomplete without a theory of teacher decision making, right? Without a theory of those levels and beliefs, we're not going to have a uh, comprehensive enough theory of, of assessment in grading in the right classroom. Now I want to focus on what this individual teacher was doing, who's I think been teaching for six or seven years, a pretty experienced teacher. Um, this person is segmenting the course, right? They're saying for most of the assignments, the like minor assignments, drafts, that's all contract based. That's all, did you complete a certain amount, right? Did you turn it in on time and not assessing for quality? And then some percentage or portion of the grade is just determined by that. But for major assignments, for final drafts of things, there's still this 100 point scale, there's still grades on final assignments. Um, we can, you know, debate whether or not that's like the right way to do things. Um, the point, my point here really is just that um, this is not kind of doing grades that's represented in literature, right? This kind of thing is, is under theorized and it's actually pretty typical. Um, I've had teachers also in the study who said, well, I'm really doing contract grading, but in order to make my students understand what I'm doing, I'm still using points, right? And if you turn it in on time and complete, it's five points. If you turn it in late, it's four points, um, just to kind of make things work for students, right, to make it make sense to students. Um, and I think it's really interesting, right, because for a lot of teachers, it comes from this place of wanting to get engagement from students, right, or wanting to make things make sense to students. But now there's a score on assignments. Now there's some sense of the teacher being uh, a judge or an assessor of student writing that maybe or maybe not kind of takes away from some of the benefits that people who write about contract writing say that you get when you're not doing any kind of grade, when you're not doing any kind of score, right? Um, 
And again, this is right, my experience is very common for teachers to somehow put in some version of points into their version of the content. Um, oh. yeah. 15, 15 minutes. So 11.5. Another major theme was the teachers found the kind of emotional or effective climate of the classroom really changed uh, under contract writing, specifically the kind of affective condition feedback. Um, one teacher said, I have more fun teaching. Contract writing allows me to be me, it allows them to be them. It's easier all around to have fun and learn. Another teacher said, I can give more authentic feedback in response to their ideas. They can see that this interaction between myself and them is not punitive. It can be about me and you using the feedback to have a conversation. But this is just the teacher's experience. I didn't get a chance to talk to students and really see if this was true in the students' experience. But I think it's worth kind of noting the dynamic um, that is happening here where teachers feel like students become more relaxed, where the overall climate of the classroom is more relaxed. And that allows them to be more authentic, which means different things to different teachers. But there's, there's, um, Something happening here in those conditions are related, right? Um, that for many teachers, giving up that role of being the judge of quality um, creates at least a sense of authenticity in their own practice. Um, I think that's really important when it comes to feedback because teachers don't just give feedback uh, for students, they also have to do it for themselves. This is a quote from a teacher, a teacher that I think illustrates this really well. She gave a lot of feedback. We're talking about how many of your students that read it, and she said this. It's more for me to do that. It feels like I did my due process, you know, being diligent and paying attention to work. And then whether our students read feedback or not, of course, I want them to read it. But then even if they don't read it, I spend some time. Giving feedback is identity work for teachers, right? It's part of how we construct who we are as teachers, as we're student writing. Um, and so when we think about how contract grades affect the feedback dynamics of the classroom, of course, we want to learn about student learning and whether it works better for students. Also, it's doing something for teachers, right? It's, it's doing something that allows teachers to be more authentic and kind of do that identity work that I think this quote speaks to in a different way that I think is important. It goes back to that some of what our first speaker today was talking about with authenticity and healing and being yourself in the classroom. Um, the last thing that I really want to highlight is uh, litmus practices. This has to do with teacher decision making. Um, I found that when teachers uh, when I ask teachers, why did you stick with contract rating? How did you know it worked for you? Or why did you choose to tweak it or change it or give up contract rating? Um, they made that decision by reflecting on a key part of their teaching practice, their pre existing teaching practices that was core to who they were as a teacher, and assessing whether or not contract rating supported that pedagogical practice or hindered it. Um, so in this case, this is a teacher, I'm not going to quote, who really, really believed in doing one on one conferences with their students. Um, she says that's one of the key things that makes me more effective in many ways. Well, she negotiated a grading contract with her students one semester, and she found that the negotiated contract, like an attendance policy that was too lax, or maybe mm -hmm. these one-on-one -on -one meetings just didn't get considered enough. And so students didn't show up for these one-on-one -on -one meetings that were so like, core to her teaching practice. Um, on reflecting on that, this teacher said, I still want to use contract rates. I like it, but I'm going to use a unilateral contract. I'm not going to negotiate it with my students, right? Um, and this was enough, right? There was there's all this other pedagogical stuff happening in this teacher's classroom. It was that one thing, what I would call a litmus practice for her. That was what what that was what, what told her whether or not contract rating worked for her. Um, I have some other examples of that, right? And there's a teacher who taught a unit on uh, language diversity that culminated in uh, major writing assignment that asked students to kind of write in their like home voice or home dialect or kind of non-academic. Language as the first unit, and so really committed to this assignment and found that um, it was kind of hard to grade, right? Well, contract grading makes teaching that assignment easier, right? Mm -hmm. Contract grading kind of supports that unit that this teacher is the core part of this teacher's practice. They're going to say, hey, contract grading works for me. It's part of how I know contract grading works for me. Um, this is one piece. This is one piece of that decision making process that goes into the levers and pulleys that teachers are constantly pulling when they try to develop sets of practices. Uh, we might get this bit about Canvas in the question if it comes up. Um, so just to close here, a few implications for researchers. Um, grouping students or class sections by the use of contract grading doesn't play the whole story. Mm. If you want to do a study where there's five sections of writing class that don't use contract grading, use traditional grading, five sections that are using contract grading, 
you want to compare the student experience or outcomes or whatever in those groups, this group that is being contract rated is not a true teacher, right? Unless you can get all of those teachers to be really consistent in how they use and deliver the contract ratings, which even if you did, wouldn't actually reflect how contract rating is used in an organic setting, right? Because mm -hmm. teachers are so blended, so idiosyncratic in how they issue grade contracts. Um, you can't just do those sort of force groups of comparison. You need something more ethnographic and more um more big description to kind of get at what's going on when teachers use these contracts, how they decide to develop them, how they um, decide to issue them to students. Um, another thing that I think needs to be paid attention to as we try to study contract rating and understand what's going on with it is that teachers use lots of different tools for MBA assessment practices. Um, we talk a lot about Canvas and Blackboard and other LMSs, um, even also thinking of syllabi as instruction technology, right? Thinking of um, a hypex situation, right? Um, there's all of these modalities and ways that teachers um, there's assessment practices that we need, right? Both by their own choice and kind of by institutional uh, structure, given based on what you know, and what you have to do in the institution that you're at. Um, finally, I think there's a lot of existing literature on teacher decision making, but it it's, tends to be centered in ESOL, right? The, um, what this calls something like teacher cognition, about teacher beliefs and values and decision making. Um, and I think bridging in some of the insights of that literature into composition studies and into kind of the conversation that's happening about contract rating and writing classrooms will be really helpful in order for us to understand and we need to theorize um, how teachers are making decisions about grading and how they can affect students. Um, finally, something for teachers um, assessment dissonance is the norm. If you're sitting there feeling like, oh, I'm just like, I don't know. Doing assessment and grading and feedback the right way, and like, it's working, but this isn't working. And like, that is normal, right? That is just how it works. Um, so, whoever needed to hear that today, you got to hear it from me. Um, <laughs> and there's a little bit of things that you can hear about off there. So, we have some discussion. Thank you all so much. I would love to hear if anyone has any findings, or just if you want to share your own experience. Um, I have a couple things. One, um, to post it out there, I'm currently in a class, equitable grading strategies. I'm through at one, that I think is really interesting. It's like a four week online course where there's all kinds of teachers that get together that were reading various things about contract rating, et cetera. And I think that people are all contributing to what they're doing and trying out. So if anybody wants to read more or wants to get more into it um, and talk to other colleagues, um, just shout out to you on that one. Um, my question, and I'm, and I'm kind of going in that direction, uh, but I have to do two things. So one, when you think about the quality of work for the students that are doing the work and completing it and check done that essay or whatever it is, how do you deal with students whose work and who put in a lot more compared to students who have done the assignment they were in and halfway there? And then my other like quandary is I tried out contract rating one of my classes, but it was like, okay, so they got an A in two of the categories, but a C in the third one. Yeah, so I'll bring up the second one first. So again, if we look at this, you can imagine a situation where a student has four non participation days, but only three later in complete assignments, right? So they're sort of in between an A and a B on the scale. Like, is that an A minus? Is that a B plus? It matters so much to the student. Like, how does it, when I was set this contract at the beginning of the semester and now it's the end, and do I talk about it? And it, it kind of gets modeled, right? Um, I, again, I think, um, like, I don't have an answer to that. Um, I think. These are the kind of things that get glossed over in a lot of the theoretical or sort of like theoretical plus here's what I did in my classroom literature that is kind of what a lot of what's published about contract rating. Um, that I think doing it's sort of just trying to ask like what are teachers doing and like what is what is happening when people run this contract rating in terms of service. Um, different people would have different answers, right? Like you could develop a really, really, really detailed chart, and then it's like this is like a weird amount of accounting. Why am I doing this? <laughs> um, one of the teachers in my sample said that, um, and I actually really like the solution is 
give students self assess right? You say, you ask them to figure out where am I on each section of this grid or box that are we representing the contract? And if they're in between, they make the argument for, hey, actually, I'm in between these two. I think I deserve this, I think that, and do some kind of conference at the end. So you're blending in some uh, self grading <clears throat> there, right? Which again kind of gets to the ungrading and all these other topics. Um, in terms of quality, this is kind of like the ages old question with contract grading is like, couldn't students just like, you know, type something like, just like transcribe, like spot the dog in children's book and get to their 300 words the assignment and it would count, right? In my experience, that doesn't happen very much. Um, but I think there are there's interesting tensions here. Is that some some people would say the solution to that is to be really really specific about the assignment directions, right? And so someone who does this give very detailed labor instructions to the students and ask them to document their process mm -hmm. such that it would actually be very hard to um, skate by in that way. That raises the question of. Are those assignment sheets so um, prescriptive that students aren't really experiencing kind of, uh, that students feel really regular um, by that? And thinking of a paper by Jennifer Trainer and Mary Solid, I rethink in regulation that kind of raises these issues. Um, and I think there's a real tension there, right? And I, I think that um, we kind of arrive within some ways of thinking about contract rating to make everything as like clear and actuarial as possible does lead us to this point of um it's like not focusing too much on it and like being too specific and and kind of um in a way that creates structures um but people do believe all different solutions yes jason you have four um, minutes for minutes for you um, yeah, I think that's a really helpful question. I feel like I love contract rating. Um, I try and get everyone to do it. Uh, but I always remind myself that like part of the, in my view, part of the point of contract grading is letting go of the nuance. Mm -hmm. So if someone who would have gotten an A gets a complete and someone who would have gotten a C on the paper gets a complete, who cares? Right. Right. The idea is that I'm, I'm putting grades over there. I don't think that grades communicate value. I know that they're wrapped up in systems of white supremacy and whatever, and that the students are more forced to find their own intrinsic motivation to do the work. And the conversation that we have about that work doesn't have to do with the grades. That it's just a up down <laughs> on the grade part. But then I struggle. I do a version of Elbow's thing about giving the A except I don't do it on quality, I just do it on quantity. Yeah, yeah and, and I don't know if that's right. A part of me is like, why am I not just making the contract for an A? And if everyone gets A's, who cares? Great. Yeah. Yeah. And this and it sort of brings us to the like, what is labor? Like an hour of labor is not actually equivalent between two students in different situations and like bodies and like, you know, phenomenological means, right? Like you can't really, it's not actually an equalizer in the way that, um, I think some people have read in a way as saying it is. It's not like a one to one comparable thing. It's a question of what it's really what it means. Um, but it's also just a leap of faith, right? And it's, it is this idea that, I mean, it's funny that Tara talked about like, what are you letting go of, right? Letting go of this idea that um, one of the things I can give my students as a teacher or should give them is a mark of excellence, right? And that is something that, like, you can hold on to as teachers because some students really like it. And we like being the person who can say, yes, you're any student different from the other ones. Um, but contract grading does kind of ask you to let go of that mm -hmm. in, a way that's, um, in a way that I think we don't we don't really have a clear understanding of what that does to teachers and how teachers reason through or feel through that kind of letting go process. Yes. Um. This might not have been the scope of your research, but um, did the instructors themselves comment on the profile of the student that would succeed using the contract grading system? Because I know we talked about it in our cohort a little bit, about the types of students that succeed using this contract grading system may you know, end up being the same students that would have done well in the traditional grading system. Yeah, yeah. Two more minutes. Okay, um, I think that, the one thing that came up was particularly for like multilingual students and specifically international students. Um, there, there was this sort of unique situation where teachers were like, you're already adapting in the case of an international student to just a different educational system. And I'm doing this thing that is like 
unusual even for this different uh you know school system that you're in um and those teachers often felt like they had to almost pull back on the contractiness and like use points and kind of use some of this like these more concrete things to make those students feel more secure um I think some teachers did also kind of express this quandary of um is like is this is this really getting me what I wanted right like it's this process to like learn how to do contract grading and it was wrong the first time you try it and then you kind of take it back and it's like oh like or is it the students who are working to extra jobs and like you know commuting like are they also still suffering in this contract grading scheme mm -hmm. because of how I designed it or the contract grading itself um but yeah, it, did not, it was not like a, a major discrete theme, at least from the way I just that so far. All right. Yeah. Thank you.